it's Janelle Waz, and it's time for Animaniacs. It's time for Animaniacs. If you were a kid in the 90s, there's a pretty good chance you sat back and relaxed and laughed until you collapsed watching The Animaniacs, a cartoon sketch comedy show that mainly followed the Warner Brothers and the Warner sister. I loved it as a kid, and as an adult, I can appreciate the genius of the show. It had an appeal to both young and adult audiences, something that a lot of older cartoons had that I feel like a lot of the more recent cartoons lack. The kids could appreciate the slapstick, while the adults had the cultural references and witty one-liners. So naturally, with such a wide appeal, there's a video game. I give it four stars. I give it five. In 1994, the Warners found their way off the Warner movie lot and onto the Sega Genesis in the first Animaniacs video game, which follows the Warners through Hollywood movie tropes on a quest to collect famous movie props. Let's review a gamey! But before I go further, make sure you subscribe to my channel. I talk a lot about Star Trek, video games, and whatever else I feel like talking about. And if you'd like to help support the channel, consider becoming a member. Be great to have you aboard. Now, you might not think that a video game based around a skit-based cartoon would have much of a plot or, heck, that it would even make much sense. The Warner's films, which made absolutely no sense, were locked away in the studio vault, never to be released. But there is indeed a plot that holds the game together. Since they're in the Warner Brothers studio in lovely Southern California, Dot wants to meet glamorous celebrities. Or, John Snots. Which I'm assuming is a parody of Don Knotts. In the bed. Yakko gets an idea to open up a pop culture shop, which involves collecting various famous props from the movies, which, considering they live on a movie studio lot, means they don't have to go very far. Here come the Warner Brothers. Wait for it. And the Warner Sister. So who do you play as in this game? Do you play as Yakko, the leader of the group? Do you play as Wacko with a bottomless stomach? Or do you play as Dot Who's cute? Cute, cute, oh, is a cute, cute, cute. The answer is yes. As you play through the game, you'll need to switch between the Warner Brothers and the Warner Sister to remove obstacles and defeat enemies. Each has a special ability, which is activated with the A button. Yakko uses a paddle ball against enemies like Ralph the Security Guard, as well as being able to move boxes. Wacko has a mallet to hit buttons, light fuses, and activate seesaws. And Dot? Well, she blows kisses to those in her path. The Good Feathers, Dracula, this random crewman. Let's face it, I'm cute! I do like this mechanic because the Warners are each an important part of the show, so it makes sense that they would play an equally important part in the game. My only problem is that to switch between them, you press the C button, which I kept confusing as the jump button, which is B. I got used to it after playing the game for a while, but it was frustrating early on. The basic gameplay is your standard platformer. Get to the end of the level, collect stars for bonuses, don't get hurt, defeat or avoid enemies, and if you get hurt too many times, you lose a life. Run out of lives, and you'll get caught by security and locked away in the tower until you get out again and continue the game. There's also a password system made up of a 3x3 grid, which is more complicated than it needed to be, considering there are only five levels in the game. Admittedly, I haven't seen the Animaniacs in years, but playing this game was like watching the show all over again. The parodies, the cultural references, the slapstick. This game is very faithful to the show. Heck, even the cutscenes that are just made up of written dialogue and animated pictures feel like they came directly from the show despite not having the voice actors. You can practically hear the characters engage in witty banter without actually hearing them. And the fact that this is a 2D platformer really fits the show. I know most games at the time were in 2D, or simulated 3D, but the Animaniacs just feel right in a two-dimensional platformer world. For comparison, I looked up the Animaniacs game The Great Edgar Hunt for GameCube, and it's just... horrifying. These are characters that should never be in 3D! Oh, who am I kidding? I'd totally get that game if it wasn't for the price tag. 
The game begins with the Warners breaking out of the tower and plummeting to the studio below. This serves as a nice intro level for the player to get used to the controls and abilities of each character, as well as featuring some familiar characters like the CEO and Rita and Runt. In fact, you'll find a lot of Animaniacs characters scattered throughout the entire game. Once you complete that intro level, you'll go to the Studio Select screen where you can pick one of four levels to complete. Each studio is a parody based on a popular movie or genre and has multiple stages with a boss fight at the end, usually featuring Ralph the Security Guard. Upon completion, you'll be rewarded with a movie prop. First up, Bungle in the Jungle, The Adventures of Dirk Rugged 7. And with that Indiana Jones fedora, it's clearly based off of King Solomon's Mines. No, this is almost certainly a parody of Indiana Jones. I mean, this is a Spielberg production we're talking about here. Who are you people? Dot finds Dirt Rugged dreamy and desires a memento. If he's dreamy, I'd hate to get a look at your nightmares. You're no Kirk Cameroon yourself. Ah, the 90s. Yakko breaks up the brother-sister argument, tells Wacko to take the high road, Dot to take the low road, and he'll be in Scotland for ye. Black Lomond. I like that this level is clearly set on a stage and not an actual jungle. From the random stagehand walking around to spotlights hanging to a literal dinosaur on mechanical legs running past. This is clearly a Spielberg set. Guys, you're gonna need a bigger boat. Oh no, this is giving me bad Lion King flashbacks. Thankfully not nearly as insanity inducing though. Okay, how the hell am I supposed to get past this? Really game? Really? And I have to time this perfectly? How many kids gave up on this part because they couldn't figure out you had to ride the rock? Rocks? Heck, there's a fair chance you'll take damage just trying to jump on it. You know games are harder in the 90s, but... This is just mean. Why did it have to be snakes? Oh! Indy's hat! I mean, Dirk Ruggins' hat! You have to battle Ralph in order to collect the hat using the boulders on the seesaw and use Yakko's paddle ball to attack him. Which the game doesn't make very obvious, so I spent a lot of time taking damage trying to jump over him. But eventually, hats off to you, Warners. You have Dirk's hat. Next studio, Space Trucking, Space Wars, the movie where Doom Raider told Ike Skyrider that he was his second cousin. I am your father's, brother's, nephew's, cousin's former roommate. So for such an iconic scene, the next prop is Doom Raider's helmet. May the first be with us. This stage has a sci-fi theme, but not just any sci-fi theme, a Star Wars-esque sci-fi theme. Featuring ships powered by the God Pigeon. Because nothing says Star Wars like a Godfather reference. And you may not actually go into an asteroid field, but the Warners will. Heck, I'm not even sure what this part is a reference to. It kind of reminds me of the older Star Wars games having a Jawa crawler level, but even that's a little bit of a stretch. I'm kind of disappointed they didn't lean more into the Star Wars references, especially since there was literally a Star Wars segment in this show. I want to see Chicken Boo as Chewie, dang it! It's Count Pot, it's a chicken, I tell ya! A giant chicken! Oh, hello, nurse. Hello, nurse. It's a nice little gag that Yakko and Wacko get distracted by the nurse, and Dot is unaffected. But then again, she should be a little distracted by Dr. Scratch and Sniff. I didn't know your eyes were blue. STOP GIVING ME OTHER GENESIS GAME FLASHBACKS, GAME! The boss for this studio is less about defeating Ralph as it is getting to the top of the level to land the final blow. Fighting flipping platforms, conveyor belts, electrical fuses, and even stage lights along the way. Because nothing screams Star Wars like pointless conveyor belt obstacles. Doom Raider's helmet? Check. And now let's take a trip to the Old West. No, not like that. Remember the a la mode. They just don't make them like they used to. Yakko used to pretend that he was Sheriff Jethro Anderson galloping into the sunset. I thought it was supposed to be the horse that galloped. Hey, Dottie. Uh-oh. Call me Dottie and you die. 
As far as I know, the studio isn't a direct reference to a specific character or movie other than the phrase Remember the Alamo, so it's just a western level. So let's ride on through with the horse we came in on and help Mindy and Buttons! Buttons! I don't know why, but seeing Buttons chase after Mindy warms my heart. I would consider this stage to be the hardest in the game for multiple reasons, and I probably spent the most time here. There are parts that aren't too bad or just mildly inconvenient, but then there are parts that are just... Why? Take the tavern, for example. Okay, a stage light fell. That's not the worst thing that can happen. Even the chandelier... whatever. Barrels? Just... barrels? These things are constantly rolling your way, and you'll inevitably get hit by at least one of them. And it turns out it was Mindy and Buttons the entire time. Just... why? Thank you, lady. I love you. Bye-bye. Platforms that drop you into fire? Oh, don't let that extra life fool you. It's not worth it, and if you fall, you're probably screwed. And even getting through all that, you can still end up losing in the boss fight. You're on a moving train, and sure, throwing pies at Ralph is cute and all, and not even that difficult, even if there is an element of luck involved. But it's the final chase that has screwed me over numerous times. First of all, you have to get on the cart before it takes off without you. Yeah, if you're too slow, you can die right there. And then you have to power the train while fighting off Ralph, who keeps jumping on the cart, with coal coming out of the engine that hurts you. It's a constant battle of switching between Wacko and Yakko and trying not to get hurt by hot coals trying to outrun Ralph. It's dumb, and I ended up feeling annoyed when I got Jethro Anderson's badge. Last studio? To scream or not to scream? Blood Mask Part 32. You know all those Janus movies, right? Like... Teddy versus Janus? Yeah, I'm not in a horror movie, so the references kinda go over my head. I just know Janus is a reference to Jason... Unless I'm supposed to pronounce it Yanis. It's Goldeneye all over again, folks! What else do we know about the Yanis Syndicate? I thought Janis died for good in part 15. He did. But if you remember, his analyst stole the mask and he became reincarnated. Then, after the analyst died in part 26, his butler became Janis briefly before handing the reins to his insurance salesman. Yakko questions if they steal the mask for their prop shop, if they too will become Janis. But that's something only the video game designers can answer. This stage is a Halloween-esque world with a Grim Reaper chasing me, and as far as I know, I have no way to fight him, so I just took the hit. But in general, I didn't find this level too difficult. Maybe it's because I got the hang of the game at this point, but for the fourth out of five levels, it wasn't too bad. The stage takes you through a graveyard into a haunted house full of floating laughing books. <laughs> Falling chandeliers, Dracula, whose heart can only be tamed with a kiss from Dot, and a flooded basement? Yeah, this is a reference to something. I don't get it. All of this leading to a boss fight with Dracula himself. I guess Ralph took the day off or something. Or he's still recovering from that train accident. Dot's kisses won't work this time, though, so you'll have to hit buttons with Wacko to make whatever platform Dracula is standing on collapse so he falls and gets a boo-boo. Eventually, he disappears, and we get Janice's mask. Now, I know the studio's select page only listed four stages, but there is still one final fifth stage. Once, there was a man named Oscar. Oscar, Oscar, Oscar! Because even though we've collected plenty of well-known movie props, we're still missing an Osc- I mean a Felix statue. Can two divorced men share an apartment without driving each other crazy? A Felix statue that looks an awful lot like Dr. Scratch and Sniff. This final stage is based around action movie tropes and not the odd couple that the stage name would lead you to believe. Explosions, an angry helicopter, and even a city in peril. All to hop in a red Corvette and get the sought-after Felix. But oh no, it's Pinky and the Brain. One's a genius, the other's insane. And what are they doing here? 
The same thing they do everywhere. Try to take over the world. Their plan today? Steal the Warner Brothers collection of movie memorabilia to brainwash the masses. Pinky, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Oh, I think so, Brain, but how do we teach a sardine to speak Russian? Pinky, I shall have to hurt you soon. More like hurt me in the final battle. And, oh... You know how there are certain things you remember as a kid that stay with you forever? Well, I remember the Pinky and the Brain segment with Brain's robot. And it freaked me out as a kid. There's something about a tiny mouse head on a huge body with an oversized chest that... simply didn't sit well with me as a kid. And here it is, as the final boss. Brain and his robot moonwalk back and forth and drop exploding bombs as the Warners have to coordinate attacks. Which again, isn't super obvious what you need to do. Dot sends a kiss Pinky's way, making him forget to light the fuse and drop a bomb. Yakko moves the bomb close to the robot, and Wacko lights the fuse. And eventually, you'll get the hang of it. Until the robot's legs break off and limit the space you can work with. This was just about as maddening as the Western stage, but in its defense, it is the final boss fight. Somehow, I managed to get Brain to grab onto the bar above him so I could move the Warners to the other side. I don't know if that helped much, but I managed to get all the props back as Brain's robot kicked itself. And there was much rejoicing to be had. Armageddon will have to wait for another day as Pinky and Brain have to go back to the drawing board. But Brain, I don't know how to draw. Pinky, you have the intelligence of a breath mint. Yakko gets an idea and has Pinky and Brain sign a contract that... I assume gives them a job at the prop shop? And they'll save up enough money to finally take over the world. Wacko wonders if they'll get another game, but Dot says after all the trouble they cause in this one, they'll be lucky to get a cameo appearance in the next game. And then the game ends. And that was Animaniacs on the Sega Genesis. If you love the show, you need this game. You can tell a lot of love went into it to make it feel like the show, and the gameplay isn't too bad either. It has moments where it's not obvious what you need to do, heck, I'm guilty of looking up solutions, but the difficulty isn't too bad for an older game if you have some patience. The humor feels like it could have come straight out of the show, the artwork is spot on, and it has all the slapstick and zaniness of the show. So, what's my final verdict of the game? I'll tell you tomorrow. So what do you think? Have you played the Animaniacs game on the Sega Genesis? Did you love it? Did you hate it? How far did you get in it as a kid? Me, I couldn't get past the first stage until years later. And what are some of your favorite Animaniacs moments? Please, leave comments below and discuss. As always, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Waz Reviews. If you like what you see, why not give my video a like and subscribe to my channel. Tell your friends! Until next time... Recess!